but can it actually lift a Saturn V rocket? That's the question that I didn't get to answer in the previous video about Sea Dragon that you see on the screen right now. This is the biggest ever rocket that was designed uh, by actual uh, scientists that never really got to unfortunately launch. I've talked uh, quite extensively about this rocket in one of the previous videos. We even got to launch it the way it should have been launched. In this video, however, we're going to be answering just one question. Can we attach Saturn V to this rocket and make it fly? In other words, can it lift Saturn V at least the second stage? If you actually look at some of the original plans for Sea Dragon, it, it often is compared to Saturn V that you see right here. And this is little people right there. Uh, and uh, the idea here was for this rocket to actually launch um, a Saturn V-like component that would then uh, propel itself to Mars. Essentially, this was a mission to Mars, slightly more crazy than other missions, because this rocket was basically launched from an ocean and it was also made of recycled parts and there's a lot of questionable uh, decisions there. Although for the most part, it actually worked pretty well, at least for us in Kerbal Space Program, and it actually launched just fine uh, from the water. It flew pretty well and was able to deliver very basic payload. But because this mission, but because this rocket's main mission was to try to launch up to 500 tons of material, we're going to try to launch it using Saturn V rocket. In other words, we're going to essentially uh, put Saturn V right here, at least part with the second stage of Saturn V, because we don't really need the first stage. The first stage of Saturn V was actually meant to take it out of the lower atmosphere, and this is the part we're not going to be attaching because it's kind of redundant. So this part is going to be attached to right here. All right, then let's take a look at this monstrosity that we've just created. Basically, this is kind of what all of it looks like. I did put a little bit of extra fuel here just to give it an extra boost in the upper atmosphere, but this is a tremendously large rocket. But here's the interesting part about all of this. This is not some crazy science fiction uh, Kerbal Space Program creation. This right here is essentially what the scientists were proposing that we make. A tremendously large dumb booster on the bottom with a Saturn V attachment on top. Altogether, this is close to about 200 meters or 600 feet in height, which is just over here. Uh, almost the size of Eiffel Tower, about half the size of Empire State Building, and uh, approximately the same size as Perfect Godzilla right here. So all in all, this is a pretty crazy creation, and even though it was only on paper, we were pretty close to actually making this if it wasn't for the Vietnam War that unfortunately drained the scientific funds. Now, this is what all of this looks like in the water. This is basically how the actual launch will uh, proceed in real life. And you can see that uh, because most of the rocket is hidden kind of like an iceberg beneath the surface, uh, you kind of um, have quite an easy access to the upper stage where you can load equipment, you can load people. So this is why in uh, on, on paper, in theory, this was actually a pretty brilliant design. And because it's in the water, um, it kind of actually reduces the noise levels, it reduces the uh, chances for failure and for, you know, explosion of the actual launch platform. So, in essence, this is a brilliant launch. But anyway, let's actually launch the rocket. So, um, what we're going to do is, uh, we're just blast the engine at, I guess, approximately 80% um, thrust level. And we're gonna start blasting it as soon as the rocket kind of starts coming up, I think, because this will give it an extra boost, uh, in a sense. But it's not really that significant. And as soon as it starts coming up, we're going to let go of um, the ballast tank. And this will officially launch the rocket. Right about now. And look at that. Brilliant. Now, I've done this about five times just as a kind of practice, uh, just to see if it even works. And honestly, every single time it launches like magic. Like, not a single explosion. No uh, exploding parts or debris flying anywhere. Um, nothing to be damaged either because there's no actual launch platform. So, in essence, this is actually a really, really, really cool design. I'm kind of surprised that we didn't follow up with this uh, in the upcoming years when NASA actually did get the funding. All right, let, let's make sure we don't go too fast though because the rocket will start wobbling uncontrollably if we do. Uh, and because I'm not blasting at full thrust, this actually suggests that well, we can actually place more stuff on top. It can totally carry more things. This rocket is a lot more powerful than I initially gave it credit. 
Um, and we might actually do this in one of the future videos. I'm just not sure what else I can place here that's even bigger than Saturn V. Um, I couldn't place the first stage of Saturn V, unfortunately, because it doesn't have an attachment on the bottom. Um, and if I try to do it Kerbal style by placing a bunch of stuff, let's actually start doing gravity turn. Um, if I try to do the, like metal rods or whatever, it unfortunately wobbles way too much and kind of sort of collapses and kills everyone. All right, so um, we are flying really well right now. This is actually a very, very stable launch. Um, I need to start doing more gravity turn though because I almost missed it by accident without looking at the altitude, um, but this is actually perfect. Now this lower part here, the booster itself, has two stages, and this is the more powerful engine, but we also have another one with a lot more fuel right here. The one that will be firing for a very, very long time. And we're going to start, um, we're gonna start blasting that really, really soon. You'll see how smooth it actually goes, but um, the problem here is and this is actually in real life as well, separating the first stage from the second stage is extremely, extremely dangerous. Now, most uh, rockets have separation boosters. I didn't place any here, though, and that was a mistake. And um, mostly because I was kind of lazy, but also because it was very difficult to place them without you know, causing too much integrity to the rocket. You'll also notice that I don't have the uh, side boosters here, like in the actual design, the ones that were supposed to basically Oh, here we go, separation. One, two, go. All right. And this will start the second engine. Any second. There we go, perfect. Beautiful separation, look at that. We can actually start blasting it higher and we might need to extend the actual booster. There we go. Uh, so like I said, I didn't really place the side boosters here mostly because um, I felt I didn't need them, but also because Oh, I need to go more sideways. Also because um, they were actually extra weight, but we will try them one day when we actually need to maneuver the rocket better. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at where we're going. We need to start going way, way more sideways than we are right now. And as you can see, this, uh, this actual booster is not as powerful as the first one, but it is basically giving us a tremendous amount of fuel here. So we're, we're gonna be able to actually get quite a lot of speed. And this is what's important. We now have to start getting a lot and a lot of uh, lateral boost. And so what we're gonna be doing now is, I guess for a few minutes, you'll just see this. Or, well, technically you won't see it because I'm going to skip this part. But basically this is what the rocket is going to be doing for the next few minutes. Um, the actual G value here is pretty high, so these poor guys are currently experiencing some absolutely insane uh, conditions. It's actually probably really hard on them. And even though, okay, yeah, you can definitely see it on their faces. Um, even though it doesn't really look like there's a lot of suffering going on, um, trust me, there is, because this uh, engine is very powerful. So it's creating an additional, I think about two and a half, maybe three Gs here. So it is actually causing insufferable pain to those little Kerbals. And at this point, I think we're almost out of fuel here, so I'm going to release the last stage and also separate um, some of the other things we don't really need anymore. And here we go. Done. Perfect. All right, so we currently actually need just about uh, maybe one more kil uh, kilometer per second delta V to get into actual stable orbit. Let's uh, decouple this thing, we don't really need it anymore. And, uh, oh, I should have actually engaged the engine there, but that's okay. Anyway, so, uh, um, let's basically, oh no, that was, that was a stupid mistake. Let's basically finish the, oh wow, it totally just exploded on us. Uh, let's finish the burn. Uh, we now need to start going toward the vector of velocity. And this is basically the second stage of Saturn V, and it has a lot, a lot of delta V. This is actually enough for us to uh, transfer to Moon, uh, transfer to Mars, and to possibly even reach other planets as well. Um, all in all though, if you actually look at the Delta V left, uh, we have about 7 kilometers per second Delta V uh, still on the ship, but that's also including the parts where we need them for like landing. But that also means that there's not enough for us to return, unfortunately. Uh, this does not actually include the return mission. This is sort of like a one-way mission to Mars. 
And if you look at my launch trajectory here, this is actually far from a perfect launch. As a matter of fact, we lost about 300 meters per second delta V uh, by launching in a somewhat more polar orbit rather than following the equator. And so here, if we were to launch this way, we would actually have even more fuel. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to um, use up all of the fuel just to see how far away we can actually get um, in terms of orbit. Uh, and uh, we're going to try to see if we can actually escape the Earth-Moon system and possibly launch ourselves on a somewhat unusual trajectory. So in other words, what we're actually doing here is we're launching our beautiful rocket with our poor little Kerbals into a one-way no-return mission, just to test the capacity of this rocket. And so, oh no, this mission actually could have had the potential of being a very successful attempt to launch and possibly land a few modules on Mars. Um, specifically, if we were to launch, I don't know, like about 12 to 15 of these rockets and uh, bring a few modules to Mars uh, that would actually serve as, let's say, uh, factories for oxygen or for our... Um, melting water, or even to create uh, various uh, tiny habitats for the astronauts. And then on the last rocket we were to launch the actual astronauts themselves, there was a, sort of a, a slight chance that we could have been on Mars and even have a small colony on Mars as early as um, 1970s, early 1970s. But like I said before, because of the Vietnam War, this sort of stopped the whole process. Uh, the military expenditure was going over the roof. The U.S. was not doing so well in Vietnam, and so, and so the entire um, NASA industry, or I guess the entire space industry in the U.S., had to divert money to the military. As a matter of fact, the defense uh, became the priority, not so much the actual space exploration. Even though the moon landings actually did happen during that period as well. And here we go. This is the end of that stage. We're now moving at a speed of about 10,800 meters per second. We're going to separate the stage. As you can see, there are separation boosters, uh, which will make it easier for us. I should have had that in my version of uh, Sea Dragon. I didn't. But because we're just testing the limits of this rocket, let's just keep going. Let's launch the next stage and see how far it takes us um, around our solar system. And as you can see from this somewhat glitchy map right now, it uh, actually looks like we did have an uh, intercept with Mars. It wasn't as um, difficult as I thought it would be. And interestingly, uh, we had quite a lot of fuel still left in the craft. So as a matter of fact, it would have been enough for us to land for sure. And possibly maybe take off and sort of orbit around Mars. And now that I'm looking at my rocket, yeah, there's definitely lots of fuel left. Three uh, kilometers per second of delta V. That is more than enough for us to at least try to uh, possibly return home. And maybe we'll do this one day uh, in one of the future videos when we actually try to launch an insane return mission from Mars using the 1960s technology. Basically, Sea Dragon, Saturn V, and a few other uh, modifications. Um, other than that though, this is actually all I wanted to show you in this video. Now you can kind of see that, uh, yeah, Sea Dragon was more than capable of launching the upper stage of Saturn V rocket. And what's even more interesting is that um, there was even some space to put some more materials in there. So it could have been a successful mission to Mars. And maybe we will have that, but I guess uh, now we only have Elon Musk to rely on because he's the only person that's sort of planning anything to Mars. Uh, his rocket is way more powerful than uh, Saturn V, but not as powerful as Sea Dragon. But because SpaceX actually has the um, self-landing technology where the rockets can land themselves and then take off again, this does put it uh, at a slightly lesser cost, actually significantly lesser cost than even Sea Dragon, which also had recyclable engines. Uh, the uh, SpaceX rockets don't even have to be re recycled per se, they just have to be repaired. So you can actually reuse them pretty quickly, as opposed to Sea Dragon, where you have to construct a lot of new parts. And with the last bits of fuel expended, um, this is it. Us flying over Antarctica and flying into the, the abyss of space. Uh, the speed right now is about 13,680 meters per second. It was actually a little bit higher before, but because we're moving away from Earth, it's slowing down. Uh, but what we can do now is take a look at the map and discover that, look at that, we're halfway to Jupiter. Um, as a matter of fact, 
uh, what's interesting here is that we would actually be able to easily reach the asteroid belt, Ceres and Vesta. And with just a little bit more fuel, we could definitely reach um, Jupiter as well. And maybe even crash land into uh, Europa or something. All in all, this is actually a pretty exciting mission. I really hope that we uh, get to see more space exploration and space travel in our lifetime. Hopefully Elon Musk does actually follow up with all of his plans. And hopefully NASA follows as well. We need more uh, private enterprises that are actually eager to explore and to discover new things. And we definitely need more rockets that are absolutely out of this world. This was a pretty cool launch. I definitely enjoyed making this rocket and kind of combining parts uh, together and doing a little bit of um, research and exploration just to see if it even works. Um, but it's definitely something that I'm looking forward to trying again. In one of the future videos, we might actually do a full playthrough of Kerbal Space Program and just to see how far we can get on like basic parts and or uh, using real realistic uh, solar system. But for now though, that's all I wanted to do in this video. Thank you for watching and if you enjoyed this, please subscribe. Leave a comment below, uh, let me know what other videos you would like to see with Kerbal Space Program and most importantly, uh, maybe even consider supporting this channel on Patreon because it does help a lot. I'll see you guys tomorrow, come back tomorrow to learn something else, space out and as always, bye bye. Not exactly what I planned for this video. That was uh, quite interesting. All right, let's try this again.